Hey, hello everybody and welcome back to our final session. My name is Bjorn. I am the research liaison here at Faunalytics. And I'm going to be moderating a panel with three of our amazing and lovely researchers that you've been seeing throughout this entire uh, conference today. We have Connie, Andrea, and Joe. So the theme and the topic is animal advocacy research today. What questions have we answered? What are we still working on? What's the future? Where are we, where are we at? just kind of in general in the animal advocacy research uh, field. Uh, we're going to be chatting for about 20 minutes about several questions, very uh, far-flung and large-ranging questions. We're going to be talking about a lot of different things. If you have any questions at all about these specific researchers and what they're working on, about animal advocacy research in general, or just something that you haven't really thought that has been answered today, feel free to pop it in the chat. And then we're going to spend about 10 minutes at the end going through those questions and making sure that they get answered. Okay, so without further ado, I wanna kind of look back a little bit and I wanna ask our panelists, what questions do you think have been answered successfully by animal advocacy research? Where, what are some of the wins? What are the successes? So I'd like to start with Joe, if we could kick it off with you. What do you think are some questions that we have successfully answered? Absolutely. Um, thanks, Bjorn, and thanks everyone who's sticking around for this. Um, so first, I just want to separate out, I think, in my own head, the idea of a success versus an answered question. This is a really research researcher answer to things, but in my view, there's a difference between being successful with research and having answered a question in its that sounds so final. I know that's probably not how you even mean it, Bjorn. Um, but in my view, it's important to think about both of those things um, separately because I think we've had amazing success in a lot of areas, uh, particularly understanding effective communication as advocates, how to present ourselves, how to engage with the public. Um, but at the same time, I wouldn't say that we are done learning about that. Uh, we know a lot, but we can definitely know more. And similarly, I think we've learned a lot over the past couple of decades, wow, um, about dietary outreach, about how to talk to people about diet change, at least in the West. And I want to make that distinction as well, that this is not a closed book, that there are big differences based on context, person, region, all of those things. And that's kind of why I'm making that distinction between success and completion. Um, but I think the panels today have also really demonstrated how much progress we've made in a really wide range of areas. Um, none of these conversations are finished. Some of them are just getting started, but I said something like this earlier today, even, even me, I've only been in part of the movement really for six, seven years. Um, and even in that time, I've just seen how much progress we've made, like pulling together these panels, this many researchers um, on so many topics with really well done research, really strong evidence and data is incredible. Even six years ago, I couldn't imagine something like this. So there's a whole lot of successes and those are just some of the ones that come to mind for me. Yeah, I'm just gonna jump in and say that I agree with what Joe's been saying, um, especially in terms of diets. Faunalytics has done so much research um, in terms of people's experiences with plant-based diets. Like we have pretty good understanding of the reasons people might want to go plant-based in the first place, how they go about doing it, the obstacles they may face along the way, the reasons people might uh, abandon those diets at some point. And because of all this information that we've gathered, we have have been able to figure out some strategies that advocates can implement to really help people as they transition to that vegan or vegetarian lifestyle. Um, like we have a pretty good understanding that feeling healthy is really important. Um, so is feeling supported, not just by those people close to you, but by society in general, you know, feeling like you're understood, like, uh, you know, you have a place in society is important. Um, cost and accessibility are huge things that um, have come up over the years. And so so with all of this understanding, we know that advocates um, can help 
for example, by advocating for uh, plant-based agriculture to be subsidized more than animal ag if we want to improve that accessibility problem. Um, just providing easy, healthy, tasty recipes for people can be really helpful, especially for people with families. And just reminding people of the motivation um, you know, the reason that they decided to pursue this goal in the first place. So I would say that we have a pretty good understanding of what it takes to better support people um, in their journey to veganism or vegetarianism or just meat reduction. Um, but like Joe was saying, that is mainly in the Western world. So we do need to keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, I want to build off both separate things that Joe and Connie said. So with Joe, she brought up a good point that the empirical study of animal advocacy is a feel like it's only really been established in the last 20 years or so. And um, I think it's great that Connie, Joe and I have pretty different backgrounds in terms of like education and academically. Like my PhD was in animal welfare science. Joe did her PhD in um, psychology. Connie has a background in wildlife conservation. So what I'm trying to get at is I'm not sure in the audience um, if you're a university university student, whether you're a college graduate student, but we need people from different disciplines to work in the animal protection field because you bring different skill sets that are equally valuable. Um, so yeah, I'll just add on to what Connie was talking about in terms of vegetarian and vegan research because that has been probably the top topic that has been heavily researched in our movement. So we now have a great understanding of demographic differences when it comes to eating plant-based. So like gender and age, for example. So we know that in general, women and younger adults are more open to eating plant-based and changing their behavior than are men and older adults. So this might seem really intuitive to a lot of you, but at least we now have the data to back up those claims. And since we have a good understanding of that now at Faunalytics, we've been conducting research that just goes beyond um, age and gender when it comes to understanding the influence of personal characteristics on people's openness to taking pro-animal actions. So we recently released a study by our brilliant research scientist, Sack, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but he looked at things like uh, person's distance to a grocery store, if the person was a primary shopper in the household, and if the person was concerned about the climate and how that was associated with them being more open to taking a pro-animal action, not just eating plant-based. He looked at so many different outcomes. I definitely encourage you to read the report. Great. So we know a lot about what is motivating people to reduce their meat or eliminate their meat and animal products, primarily in the West. A pretty good research base has been established. But let's take the other side of that coin. Like, what are the biggest gaps in our understanding of animal advocacy? What do we not know at the moment? Where should we put it, be putting our efforts into understanding more? So whoever wants to take this one. Yeah, I can go. Um, so I would say, well, as Joe was alluding to before, there is a like a big geographical gap in our understanding. You know, most research that's been done in the animal advocacy space has been focused um, in the global West and that knowledge isn't necessarily applicable to all regions of the world. You know, we can't really generalize the findings that we have to all regions. There are definitely cultural, economic, political, uh, social aspects that we need to keep in mind. And these will change uh, throughout the different regions of the world. So what may work in North America isn't necessarily going to apply to South America or Africa or Asia. So going back to the diet example, um, while we've done a lot of research on transitioning to plant-based diets, our focus has been in the Western world. Um, and we can't assume that people are having the same experiences with veganism or vegetarianism in other parts of the world. They may be facing different obstacles with their diets than what we've seen here. And so the strategies to overcome those obstacles will probably be different. So we do need to move beyond North America and Europe to gain a better understanding of how we can better um, advance and just support animal advocacy in the rest of the world. If I can jump in on what Connie was saying there. I feel like Varda's keynote was such a great example of how to do this kind of work. Um, the intersectional, multifaceted approach to advocacy. Um, it, on the one hand, it can seem 
intimidating doing so many things in so many different ways, engaging with all different kinds of stakeholders. But at the same time, that is exactly what we need to be doing. And I think it's a sign of how far our movement has come with research and understanding through data uh, that we're at a point where we're trying to tackle those big multifaceted questions in our research as well. They aren't as studied yet because it is incredibly difficult to study something like how does talking to corporations interact with global trade between this country and that country with talking to the governments that regulate that trade and talking to consumers at the same time. All of those things are happening simultaneously and it's incredibly complex and I'm a social psychologist by training, as as Andrea mentioned, like my background is entirely put people in small room, make them do small tasks. This is such a massive departure from that, but it is just essential that we find ways to talk about these harder to measure interconnected systems because that's what we're dealing with. And we're up against huge companies, mega corporations, global corporations that have all the money and what we have is brains and passion and a lot of people that we can get to pull in the same direction, in my opinion. We just need to communicate well and figure out how to study these things and how to work on them in a collective way. Um, yeah, so in terms of being able to understand what we can understand in animal advocacy, I think there's been a lot of useful metrics that the effective altruist Thick movement has introduced for our movements, um, but I also think it's important to hear um, people who are critics, critical of effective altruism to see what uh, they have to say. So there are, you know, groups who work on, for example, race, class, and access to plant-based food, for example, who have come out and said that because of effective altruism, saying this type of advocacy can be quantified and this can't, it has limited, um, just like the movement's understanding of the potential impact that more grassroots advocacy can have. So I think that unfortunately has led to a big gap in our movement right now is that um, there has just been this large influence on, again, like, you know, we have certain metrics, therefore, if your advocacy type can't be measured with those metrics, then we're just losing a lot of understanding with the potential impact that they can have. So by understanding these gaps and understanding the questions that we've answered, what do you three think is the future of animal advocacy research? What are the questions that we're going to be tackling over the next five years, the next 10 years? Where should we be thinking about this? What's the future of the research? I don't mind going uh, first for this. Um, so for, in my opinion, I definitely see a lot more region uh, specific research in terms of understanding how to prevent factory farming from expanding, for example, in areas like Africa, or how to minimize the harms of factory farms in areas like Brazil and Southeast Asia. So as Connie was saying um, before, and Joe as well, there's a lot is known about the US and specific European countries in terms of the harms of animal agriculture and getting the public to change their habits. But what works best there doesn't necessarily mean it'll work best in other parts of the world. So at Faunalytics, we actually do plan to do more research investigating animal advocacy in Southeast Asia. And we collaborate with the organization Good Growth, who you got to see speak in our first session when we do this type of work, as they have the local knowledge about advocacy in that region. So again, it's really important to actually work with folks that have the local knowledge of different countries when you're conducting research in those areas, as it allows you or helps ensure that you're going to be culturally sensitive and make sure you're asking um, appropriate and right questions. Yeah, um, I agree with Andrea. I mean, I was kind of talking about this before with the question about the knowledge gap too. So um, I think addressing that geographical uh, knowledge gap is really important. Um, and it makes sense, you know, that the future of animal advocacy research lies in part in um, expanding to other parts of the world. Um, and I'll add to that, that um, in addition to conducting research in more neglected areas, I think that more research on particular particularly neglected animals might also be in the future. So like wild animals and insects and aquatic animals. 
um, especially with the environmental and the climate crisis that we're facing right now, I think it's really important that we understand how the lives of wild animals are impacted and what we can do to help them. And along those lines, um, insect farming is really on the rise as what's viewed as a more sustainable source of food and protein. Um, but our understanding of what this means for those insect lives is really lacking. So I think that having that information could really help advocates um, do more to help these animals um, in the future, hopefully soon. So I don't know, I see a, a future in, uh, in research in these more neglected areas for sure. I just want to chime in and shout out again, Connie's background in conservation, and she's actually doing some of that research into connections between environment and animal advocacy right now, looking at collaboration opportunities, um, as well as the recent report that she did in conjunction with Sentient Media about uh, the harms of animal agriculture for climate and how they're reported on. Um, She's modest, but I will shut that out for her. Um, so in addition to thinking that things like that are super important, I also uh, just circle back to this idea of needing a higher level systems understanding. And I think a lot of what I would like to see more of in that sense is getting some more people who understand macroeconomics don't immediately close out of Zoom, um, but just people who come in with that kind of background uh, to be able to uh, convey these really complex concepts about just how money goes into animal agriculture, how it comes out of animal agriculture, how much power is consolidated amongst these big companies. Like that is not my background. Um, our researcher, Zach, who does have an economics background is putting out this report in a couple of weeks all about this and I will be fully honest with you I learned so much just from reviewing this work that I am incredibly excited to put it out there and it immediately made me think okay this is amazing and we need more of it we need to bring more economists ec economists into the movement we need to bring more sociologists with a big understanding of social change and how that happens and I mean the other part of it is just having a big variety of types of research that are happening. Andrea highlighted that with respect to our own team, which is small but diverse, but on a broader level as well. Um, again, it was just really cool today to see all the different types of people's research that, that everyone was talking about. We're all working toward the same goal. And I think that's what phonolytics is all about. That's what our movement is all about. Everybody just working to help animals in our own way with our own research um, and all working toward the same goal. I can't help but notice that many of the things you three have identified as future directions are also things that our amazing uh, speakers today have been talking about. Different global perspectives, neglected animals, aquaculture, wild animals. So... It kind of leads me to believe, and I think many of our audience would agree, that many of the people here and their ideas are really going to be instrumental to the movement in the next decade. I, that's what I certainly Um, So we just have one or two minutes, and uh, then we're going to get to all of the audience questions. I just want to ask the three of you, just for a few seconds, because we don't have that much time, just tell me a person or an organization whose research you find very inspiring and that you're particularly excited by. <laughs> Call on me. Um, everybody who spoke today, first of all, uh, you are all amazing. And thank you so much for sharing your work. Uh, someone who is not here today, but I hope that some of you have heard of is Farsha Saha, who is doing amazing and I think not as well known as it should be research um, from a political science lens, which is another field that's, I think, underrepresented within the movement. Um, she's looking at what political candidates can say when they talk about animal rights, animal welfare, um, and finding essentially that there's a lot of fear in the movement um, when we're talking about veganism or our own agendas, uh, when we're talking about farmed animals. And I think a lot of that is valid. It's coming out of research and data from the past. Um, but what she's finding is that when you're in a leadership position, that you have a certain amount of ability to uh, talk about things and influence others rather than turning them off, which 
as I'm sure any of you know from just looking at leaders in the world today, is not always the case, but she's looking more into investigating the nuance of that in a way that I think is really important because for us as a movement, putting people into positions where they can become leaders, political figures, um, you know, working in the mayor's office in New York City, for instance, um, you can have a huge you can have a huge impact that way. And so understanding how to communicate when you are in that kind of position and put animal welfare, animal protection at the forefront is just incredibly important. So great work from Sparsha. I'll flip it and talk about an organization I'm really excited about um, is work by the Middle East Vegan Society. So I saw Seb Alex give a talk at the Animal Advocacy Conference earlier this year. Um, and he was talking about how they plans to actually have outreach materials uh, developed and how it talks about how veganism is aligned with Islam. So if some of you folks were here earlier today, you saw Alta Musha's talk um, on that topic. So it's great that, um, you know, there's work being done on this in terms of, you know, grassroots advocacy and outreach material. And I'll be really quick with my answer. <laughs> um, so I'm a little biased uh, just because of my background um, in wildlife conservation, but um, I'd say I'm really excited about wild animal welfare research that's to come. Um, we saw a great presentation today from Willem. Um, also Wild Animal Initiative is funding academic studies into wild animal welfare that I'm excited to see what comes out of that. There's a fairly new wild animal welfare program at NYU. Also really excited to see what comes from that. So just curious to see what new information we can gain um, from their research and how animal advocates can apply it in the future. Very good. Lots of great resources out there. Lots of great work to follow. I'm going to jump into the audience questions. If you want to ask a question, now is the time to put it in. Um, Rachel Mason has a question. Uh, do you see the movement evolving in the direction of greater coordination and a common strategy? How would that work when you have a loose connection, a loose collection of organizations without a single authority? So what do you think, the three of you? How would you respond to that? I would say it's region specific again. Um, like, yes, there's animal advocates all over the world and we have the common goal of, you know, abolishing animal agriculture, another type of exploitate, exploitative system. But again, what's going to work really well in one area or region of the world isn't necessarily going to work well in another region or world. Um, I do think there is better coordination in terms of researchers, at least, like, uh, at least for hesitant to say like big organizations. Um, we do have like intergroup meetings where we talk about our own research. So there is coordination on that end. Um, but yeah, maybe Joe or Connie can chime in. Well, it's no fair that this question comes from Rachel because <laughs> I've been talking about your work a lot, Rachel. Um, she's looking into this kind of question of how to coordinate and what people are doing and uh, looking at the movement as a whole in terms of how we try and take action. Um, I do think that it is absolutely possible to coordinate better than we're doing now, but that we've also made big strides. Um, and I think the reason I keep talking about your work is because I think having a central understanding that we're all coming from the same uh, basically giving us a playbook that if not everybody, at least a large proportion of the movement can agree, this is what we're trying to do. Here are our talking points or here are the things that we're working on um, so that it's relatively coordinated. And I do think that's possible, but I also think Andrea is absolutely right. There's regional differences. I think there's also a tendency to slip into thinking of our own species that we tend to focus on, um, whether that's farmed animals or wild animals, um, and not think about connections as much with companion animal issues or animals used in science. Um, and so I think part of what's needed is interdisciplinary, if you want to call it that, inter-sub-movement, um, things like this today, where you are seeing people working on different types of issues. and ordinarily might be siloed a little bit more, but there's such connections between all of these different types of work that we're doing that I think we need to remember that and seek it out and explore possibilities for working with other movements or 
areas of our own. So Stephen Rook, ha I hope I pronounced that right, has a question about researcher capacity building. So what type of work is being done getting more researchers, more academics on board with pro-animal research or elevating the status of this type of research? Do we do that at Phonolytics? Uh, do other organizations do that? What's the status of this? Whoever wants to take this one. Well, there is a new academic society called Fair Society. I'll put it in the chat. Um, basically, their goal is to be like a hub of academics, particularly in social sciences, who do this type of work uh, researching animal advocacy. And they're hosting um, a conference every two years. So the conference I mentioned where I saw Sub Alex give a keynote talk, um, that was by me. So they are um, research capacity builders for our space. And I definitely encourage you to check. They have like an open access journal as well. And there's also um, a group called RECAP, Researchers to End Consumption of Animal Products, which I'm a co-leader of. Um, anyone who is a, uh, a researcher working anywhere in this general space is welcome to join that. Um, we do monthly calls uh, talking about research in progress or research that's been completed and uh, just trying to share what everyone is up to because there is so much going on now, which is incredible. I'll just add that uh, collaboration is really important. Um, we're definitely doing some studies with uh, academics and I encourage other people that may be doing research to also um, reach out to, I don't know, university, see if there's a potential for collaboration there because that is another way to get more involvement. Serenity has a question that kind of bounces off what was that said earlier about the demographics of vegans and plant-based eaters. Even though we know that vegans and plant-based eaters are disproportionately women, uh, many activists in the movement, at least at first glance, appear to be majority men. Do you have any idea about research that explores this? And if you don't, do you have any potential hypotheses about why this could be? On the top of my head, I don't know any research that has looked into it, but that would be a great research question um, to try to collect some data on. I have some hypotheses too, but they would be built off like feminist critical animal studies scholars. So I, I don't know if Joe or Connie want to. I mean, it, it might be the same general point uh, in terms of what circles you're talking about. I'm not sure, um, but certainly my observation over the last number of years is just that uh, the kind of classic animal advocate sector, if you want to call it that, does tend to be majority women, whereas the uh, effective altruist animal advocates um, are majority men. And that's established and supported by our own surveys of the two groups. Um, and then I think more broadly within any context, within any domain or workplace, um, we know that that uh, higher level positions are historically more often held by white men in the West. And that's true in animal advocacy, like in any other sector. So that's that's my suspicion, uh, strong suspicion of why you observe some of those things, partially different sort of sub areas of the movement and partially just historical uh, reality of things. So Ian, uh is asking if there would be potential impact if there was a course on emerging issues in the animal welfare world in universities and other such institutions. Um, do you think that would be impactful? Do you happen to know of anything like this? I think there's been a few randomized controlled trials in terms of the impact of classroom education. Um, which you can find in our library, but there is uh, definitely a positive impact for those like lecture to change people's diets right after. So I think, I'm not sure if the person was asking more of like an actual university course where it's just, it's more than like a few lectures. Um, there's definitely, def it has been shown through previous empirical evidence that that does have a positive impact on people's diets. So.
Okay. Um, we're almost out of time. If you have a question, you can put it in right now. Um, I do see one last question. Give me a moment. I'm trying to find it in the chat. There you go. From Maynard. Should we hope to develop non-animal research methodologies so that robust bodies of strategies can become the default as opposed to the alternative? Does anybody have anything to say to that? I mean, yeah, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Krebs presentation and Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is doing a lot of that work. Um, so totally encouraged to check them out. Like we at Phonolytics don't do that type of research unless there's like a social science aspect to it. But yes, absolutely. We should be um, encouraging that. Um, if I can chime in for one moment, I just noticed that a few people have been asking for the link for the recap group that I mentioned. Um, so I've just dropped it in the chat and we've shared it in a couple of threads. I will just mention that the primary aspect of the group, the monthly calls, is restricted to researchers only. Not to be exclusionary, but more just because sometimes when you're talking about any work that's in progress, whether that's research or something else, it can be a little bit vulnerable to share about it. And so we want to make sure that it's a safe space for researchers to be able to talk about things that are in progress. Uh, but if you are a non-researcher who's interested, you're welcome to join the Slack and the kind of research news channels uh, are open to everybody. There's also, I, sh I should also shout out, um, there's also the uh, impact Impactful Animal Advocacy Slack as well, um, which has conversation about today's event, but also more general about research, about advocacy, making connections between different groups. Um, so we should probably share that link again, uh, but that would also be a good one for anyone to join. There's hundreds of people on there, so it's a great resource hub. Thousands, actually. I mean, there's a, a lot of people in that organization. I'll put the link one more time into the chat if anybody's interested in joining. I believe I have asked all the questions for the audience. Um, thank you very much for the three researchers. If you're interested in any of these three people's studies, they have lots of new stuff coming out in the next months and years. So keep tuned to follow. Uh, and with, with that, I'm going to pass it to Brooke for some closing remarks.